Okay, welcome back everyone to BOE Shieldbot for Arduino Educators course workshop session three. Today we'll do a quick review, uh, followed by actually Whisker uh, navigation Q and A would be part of the review. Then we'll try out the infrared navigation applications. After that, a curriculum tour, um, along with questions and answers. And we'll, we'll also uh, take a quick look at, actually, let's change this around a little bit. I think questions and answers would be best placed at the end. So uh, yeah, Navigate by Light, we'll talk about briefly. And then we'll also talk about apps outside the book, kits and uh, kits and up, other upgrades, and then we'll have our Q and A. First item for review: remember that the uh, it, this is a tail wheel dragging robot. So the, these are the differential drive wheels, and this is forward and the breadboard should be in between the differential drive wheels. In order to make the Shieldbot move forward, the wheels have to be turning opposite directions. In order to make the Shieldbot go a particular distance, there's two steps. Set the wheel speed, and then set the amount of time you want it to travel that distance. And you could also think about a, a third step of you'd either have to change the wheel speeds to stop the motion or simply go to a new maneuver. All right, so um, here is an example of, I think I wanna maybe zoom in on that somehow here. Okay, let's take a look at backward. So here um, we're setting up a, a pulse that's 1300 microseconds and that's for the left servo. Here we're setting up a pulse that's 1700 microseconds. That's for the right servo. That makes them turn in opposite directions and then um, this is inside a function. So whatever time is, let's say time is 1000. Well, maybe it'll get, go forward, say nine inches or something like that. If we changed time to, or backward, pardon me. If we changed time to 2000, it would go twice as far because it would travel the same speed for twice as long. So this is where you do speed and direction. And that's where you do the navigation time. Let's see if I can open a better example here. All right, let's see if this looks any better. Yes. Okay, so this, this is forward, left, right, backward from chapter four. And so here we have our full speed forward with 1700 to the left servo and 1300 to the right servo. So one is 200 above the stay still signal of 1500 microseconds and the other is below. Now, um, so if I, if I leave this at 2000, it'll go one distance. If I double that, that number, it will roughly double the forward distance. Direction and speed, distance as a function of time. Notice that if we're rotating in place, um, both, the, both the numbers are the same. 
And so this, this one will rotate in place to the left. And if we change the wheel speeds to the opposite direction, it'll rotate to the right. And then keep in mind that backwards is just really the reverse of forwards. So if we look at, if we look at what we're using in each argument in the function call here, it's 1700 to the left and 1300 to the right. And this is the opposite with 1300 to the left and 1700 to the right. Okay, so pop quiz. What happens if I make this one 1550 and this one 1450? If I can actually type that. Uh, I need to open up the chat to see what folks are saying. Anybody want to chat me uh, what the result would be for this? It's, slower. it's going to go slower. Yeah, we could actually really, since the linear speed control range is, is a deviation of about plus or minus 100 from 1500, we could actually call that half speed forward. All right. Good job, everyone. Uh, any questions before I move on? All right. Now there are other ways to, um, so here is actually the, uh, here, is the, here is one function way to do it where we're calling functions and simply passing the time. And then we have, the, oh, I, I'm sorry, I should move, go back one spot. Um, what do you think would happen if I changed this turn left uh, from 1300 to zero. I'm sorry, to 1500. There we go. What do you think would happen there? It's gonna pivot around that wheel. That's correct. Left wheel stays still because it's 1500. Uh, the right wheel will still be going full speed forward, so it'll pivot around the left wheel. Okay, now coming back to um, another thing we talked about is functions. And so you can write several useful utility functions and just call them. Um, and this type of function does, you know, forward, left, right, and backward, left and right turning in place. Uh, and then you simply tell the function how long to do that. And for forward, that's how long to go forward. For turn left, it's also how long to turn left, which controls how far it will rotate to the left and likewise for turn right. Then um, this is the one I recommend using most of the time it, when your students are at project phases, which they essentially use this maneuver function down here. And it takes away all the, a lot of the ambiguity. When it says maneuver 200, 200, um, the, the function is dealing with subtracting on the um, right side and adding to 1500 on the left side. So this 200, 200 means left wheel, full speed forward, right wheel, full speed forward, and then um, for two seconds. Then this would be left wheel, full speed reverse, right wheel, full speed forward, for 0.6 seconds. So, uh, so yeah, uh, the maneuver function is very useful and it's, it's worth um, setting aside and pasting into projects so that you can just uh, write code in terms of maneuvers, much simpler. Um, we also talked about navigation with arrays and then uh, essentially a for loop will end up, uh, in this case, calling the maneuver function, accessing each element in each array, starting here, then there, then there. On day one, we talked about LEDs, but I forgot to mention that the LED has, um, it, I did mention that it's a one-way current valve, but I didn't mention how to tell uh, its directionality. And the way to tell, there are two ways to tell. One is that it's gonna have a longer pin and that longer pin corresponds to this side of the schematic symbol and it's called the 
see here, that one's called the anode. Then the shorter pin is called the cathode and uh, current flows through like that or electrons flow through the other direction. Um, in electronics, current is normally um, considered from the positive down to the negative terminal, but in physics and in reality, the, um, the electrons flow the opposite direction of, of what we use to describe current in most uh, calculations and schematics. So when the Arduino, instead of connecting something to a battery, if you connect a light to the Arduino, your sketch is going to essentially tell the Arduino, hey, uh, connect the, you know, connect this pin to five volts, wait for a while, connect that pin to zero volts, wait for a while. There's an inverse of that, which is checking a pin. Now, when you're checking a Arduino pin or, or socket uh, to, to figure out whether five volts or zero volts is applied, it's no longer an output. It's not sending five volts. It's not sending zero volts. What it's doing is it's checking to see whether, um, whether the voltage is above 2.2 volts or below 1.1 volt. And um, if it's above uh, 2.2 volts, it's gonna say, or I'm sorry, whoopsie. Um, it's, a, it's above, I believe, two thirds of five volts, whatever that is. I'm gonna to have to look that up, I apologize. I, I was thinking about a different microcontroller. Um, at any rate, there's a high signal. And so in, in the case of whiskers, um, when the whisker is not pressed up against the three pin header, five volts is being applied to the input through a, um, through a fairly large resistor. And then there's a smaller resistor, but this is just to protect against coding mistakes. Um, we just kind of put a resistor in the way to prevent a short circuit where there would be no resistance. And maybe this was high, but it was connected to ground. And so that would, that would be um, something that would be kind of hard on the, the Arduino's IO pin and could even cause damage. All right, so, so here we have five volts. Um, and this is called a pull up resistor. And these are all items that are introduced in the textbook. Um, and so the, the five volts through this large resistor is why when the whisker is not pressed, it always says, hey, I, I, I'll give you a one if you ask me with digital read of seven, what, um, what the value is of the voltage connected to socket seven. Now, when you press the whisker, it's uh, shorting the rest of that circuit to ground through the, the three pin header, or at least to this point. And so what we have is zero volts and the Arduino sees that through this small 220 ohm resistor. There's also a little bit of current that travels from five volts to ground as, as it's pressed. And the, the main thing though, is that um, digital read of seven is going to return a zero. And so this digital read of seven, either returning a one or returning a zero is what we use to uh, determine whether the whisker is or is not pressed. These are the whiskers pressed against the three pin headers. And when the whisker is not pressed, certain actions um, are, well, basically there's a series of if, else if, else if, else statements that will select what to do. And when nothing, when neither of the whiskers are pressed, it's just the else case, which has it go forward for 20 milliseconds and then check again inside the loop the next time. And so it, as it's going forward, it's very rapidly checking to see if the, one of the whiskers has been pressed. Now, when a whisker has been pressed, like let's say the left whisker is pressed, then essentially it'll call the backwards function with uh, and make it go for 400 milliseconds. And then the, uh, I'm sorry, it'll make it go for a thousand milliseconds backward. And then it'll make it turn right for four milliseconds. And then it, it jumps out of this if, if, um, if condition, hits the end of the loop function, goes back up, and then starts checking again. Now, the, at this point, the whisker would not be pressed, and so it would probably start going forward again and checking about 50 times a second. Okay, um, 
any questions before we move on? Just wanted to hit those kind of important points. Uh, yes, I have one question. Okay. Um, and it has to do with uh, putting that 10K um, resistor into the actual parallax board itself. Uh, have you ever experienced um, a weak connection where you're putting the resistor in and it just doesn't feel like it's grabbing? Um, well, yes. When we used, uh, we, we received a shipment of eighth watt resistors. These are quarter watt resistors. And so their, um, their leads are supposed to be a little bit thicker than the eighth watt resistors. The eighth watt resistors definitely were not grabbing. Um, I have not actually had an experience with quarter watt resistors not gripping. Um, it's not impossible that we, um, well, actually I have a brand new part to get right here. So I will go ahead and pull out a, a resistor just to make sure that that are not really large enough. Yeah, when you're going inside of the white breadboard, you can really feel you've got a real solid connection. It's true. Yeah. It is a little looser on the five volt end. It's, it's not quite as tight as the breadboard, but I'm still getting a decent squeeze as I, as I, as I okay. insert the, uh, let's see here. Oh, here, I'm about to switch over to this one. Yeah, because I had a situation where the code was working and then it wouldn't work, you know, same setup. And then I started investigating and I said, wait a minute, I got a loose connection here. Okay, well, let's, um, let's talk about that then. And if anybody else has, has experienced a loose connection, it, it, they sh these connections should not be loose. I mean, I, I could imagine if something largish was you know, if a student attempt to set, press kind of a, some kind of part that has a really wide diameter lead into it, then it, it might push the little socket apart, but just normal, um, normal pushing a resistor in there is not supposed to, uh, okay. let's see here. Yeah. Cause when I, um, when I push that resistor in, it's, uh, I, I can definitely feel it when I press it in and pull it back out. I can feel it grip. So I, I think, I think you all should be okay on the bots that you have and the parts that you have. Um, so yes, do, do contact education at parallax.com if you um, think you might have any defective parts. Okay. And then how is, how is the robot you're working with today, Bob? Is that one okay? Yeah. I, I, I don't know if you can see. I can see fine. Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Then I, I was able to, um, uh, to, to make good progress and, and I had the experience of the robot actually working. Excellent. So yeah. Your whiskers circuit terrific. looks good. Yeah, so that's terrific. And okay. I, I really needed to thank you for sending those additional files for the few people like me that were using two computers. That really helped. Yeah, I really slapped my forehead last night. Wish, wish, wish I'd have had the thought sooner, but at least we're, we're good now. <laughs> yes, my pleasure. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna we'll do is move on to the infrared circuit, because that one's pretty neat. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of learning. This one's right at the end of the book. And so the infrared circuit, the way it works is, or rather the parts that we're using are, um, if you remember back in the days when your infrared remote uh, was the kind that you actually had to point at the TV, some of you may still have that kind. Um, others may have upgraded to, you know, some sort of Bluetooth or, uh, or radio control remote. But the old um, 
the old infrared remote had an infrared LED in it, infrared being below red in wavelength. And so you'd point it at the TV and it would flash the infrared LED in a sequence in a sequence that would tell the television what channel to turn to or to up the volume or, or whatever you, you wanted to do with the TV from your couch. And inside the TV, there's an infrared receiver that essentially um, reproduces those um, flashing on and off sequences electrically inside the TV. And then those signals tell the microcontroller inside the TV, okay, time to turn the volume up. So th these parts though, can be used this this little infrared LED since it shines a light that we can't see and since this infrared receiver can uh, detect that light that we can't see um, and by the way it has to flash it on and off really fast uh, 38 thousand times a second or 38 kilohertz in order for this to even see it or to detect it rather but since it can detect that well you can use this as a little infrared flashlight. And so um, inside your shield bot, as a flashlight, it would be flashing the infrared on and off. And if that in flashing infrared reflects off an object, comes back to the IR, IR receiver, the IR receiver actually sends the same signal as a whisker does when it's pressed. It sends a zero. Likewise, if, um, if the infrared LEDs flashing on and off just goes off into space and does not come back to the receiver, the receiver sends a one, just like the whiskers would when they're not pressed. So um, the first step in building your circuit is going to be to find two infrared LEDs. Now, I want you to be very careful because the infrared LED um, is going to have the same shape as the red LED. It's going to be clear. There's another device with a, a little clear um, plastic package with two leads coming out of it. It's shorter. So make sure you find the, the two types of clear packages and then choose the longer of the two. See how this is kind of short compared to this one? So we want to choose infrared LEDs, infrared light emitting diodes. And then what we want to do is push the infrared LED into the black tube that's in your parts kit. And then there's a smaller black tube that will snap on the top of it. And we want to do that for two infrared LEDs. Thank you, Eric, for sharing the tip about using an Android phone to see the um, infrared light. Ah, uh, yes. That is like, did I skip this? I, I did somehow. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this is my old Android phone. Well, actually, no, this was an even older phone. But yeah, Android phones are pretty good about seeing um, the infrared LED. So essentially, when you're, when you're not pressing the button, it looks like that. And when you're pressing the button, it looks like that. Let's see. I'm going to see if I can dig out my infrared remote. Hope that it still has batteries. Okay. Uh, sometimes document cams work. We're going to put that to the test right now. First, unfreeze the image. Okay. So I am currently not pressing the light. And now I'm there pressing and holding it. There we are. <laughs> and that's the uh, that's the camera kind of sampling since it's flickering um, at 38 kilohertz and then taking 0.6 milliseconds break between its flickers. Um, you're kind of sometimes catching it on and off, and it looks like it's visibly flickering in the in the um, in the screen, but that's it, it would not be detectable by the human eye if you put a red light there it would just appear to be dim. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Okay, so next up we're going to um, I, think I will uh, go with you and find those infrared LED parts in my parts kit. So I have another one already empty over here. Okay, so um, 
there's also a shortcut to making sure that you don't have um, accidentally have a light sensor. And that is to simply find the little plastic bag that has the um, black plastic tubes because those, uh, the, 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 the light emitting diode, one of them is right there. And so, uh, so, so if you just grab this baggie that has the black plastic tubes and the infrared receivers, you'll know you've got the infrared LEDs. And then that way you don't have to worry about the rest of them. I am going to, however, uh, take the real infrared LED and the real uh, light sensor photo transistor and set them next to each other just to show um, what they look like. So that's the um, photo transistor. And then the, I'm, yeah, that's the photo transistor, which we use as a light sensor in chapter six. And then this right here is the infrared LED. And you can see how much taller, hopefully, the little plastic case is on the infrared LED. So if it has a kind of a short stubby plastic case, clear plastic case, that's a um, photo transistor. You don't want to use it. Um, you want to use the taller dome-shaped uh, plastic case infrared LEDs. And then here are our plastic tubes and infrared receivers. And uh, so yeah, just go ahead and, and there's, there's two small holes in the bottom of the plastic tube. We're almost visible there for a second. There they are. Okay, so those two holes, you basically want to um, insert the LED into the long, the longer of the two tubes. And then get those leads. You want one lead going through each of the holes in the bottom of the plastic tube. It's called actually an LED standoff. So hopefully you can see there that they're not squished together coming out of one hole. Each one is coming out of its own hole in the bottom of the tube. And actually the, the plus and the minus, I, my, uh, it, I think it works either way, but I, the, the plus would want the, the longer pin. You can see a plus and a minus on the bottom here. So, um, so once you've got that in, then take the short tube, which I think is called an LED shield, correct me if I'm wrong, Ari or Stephanie, and go ahead and snap it on the top. And also note that since this is a light emitting diode, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to have a shorter and a longer pin. Make a note of that because we'll be using the longer and shorter pins as we connect this. So then, we, uh, then go ahead and repeat for the next one. All right. After that, We are going to build a circuit that um, I actually skipped over showing you the parts list. So I'm gonna call out the parts list. Um, we'll wanna grab um, two black jumper wires, two red jumper wires. And um, I'll start with that. Um, if you can, can everybody see this okay so that they can see they, they need red, black, red? 
for uh, two resistors and then red, red, brown for another pair of resistors. Is that visible for you? Okay, I'm getting thumbs up. Okay, excellent. Well, let's just stick with this then. Uh, so it's time to um, disconnect your, you can take everything off, but the, uh, so we'll wanna take our whiskers off. So unscrew slightly each of these front screws and take the whiskers off. And then um, take everything, leave the piezo speaker and its wires on, but take the rest of the whisker circuit off and then go ahead and build up this one. And uh, let's see, but, uh, but of course, before you do that, make sure to get um, two red jumper wires, two black jumper wires, two resistors with the red, red, brown color code, and two resistors with the red, black, red color code. That's 220 ohm and two kilo ohm. That is also slide 103, if you have the slide show up on your computer. So again, two red wires, two black wires, two red, black, red resistors, and two red, red, brown resistors. Careful not to use red, red, red. We want red, red, brown, and red, black, red, two of each. And you did say red, black, red, correct? Correct, red, black, red, yes. You'll see some resistors that are taped together. Um, the red, black, red, and the red, red, brown were both uh, loose in the package. And all of them are going to have a, a fourth gold stripe. So I'm just calling out the stripes that are not gold. Make sure to retighten the front standoffs after you've removed the unhooked the whiskers from them. You just loosen the screw a little, unhook the whisker, and then retighten. Um, incidentally, for this, I'd like you to have your power set to zero, please. And in general, when, uh, when students modify their circuits, it's best for them to keep their power turned off. Now, um, the anode leads, these ones in the middle here, this is an all points bulletin heads up or eyes on the screen, everyone. The anode leads right here are gonna be the longer leads. 
the ones that are toward the center of the breadboard. The shorter cathode leads are gonna share the center pin of the IR receiver and then black ground wires. Make sure that your parts, that your leads are all sinking in a good quarter of an inch into their sockets. Otherwise, they're not, um, they're not really going to make the electrical connection that you need. The black wire is going to ground should be on the center pins of the IR receivers. Those are the little square boxy things. Little black square boxy parts or three pins. Jessica, did you find the parts? Hi. Um, yes, I I don't find that cap for our standoff. We have three standoffs mm -hmm. and only one cap, but it's okay. We we can go without it, right? I mean, we don't. Do you have any? Still put it in the base. Yes. Yeah, that will be good. And do you have any masking tape or some kind of tape? Uh, sometimes without the cap, the infrared light can go sideways and start interfering. So if you can add some tape uh, as a replacement of the cap. Yeah, ideally, if you have electrical tape handy, I know I know not very many people do, but that that's nice and <laughs> that 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 will do the same job. That works. Yep, we can do that. Thank you. That's oh, sure. Idea. And you can also always contact us through education or sales if there's an item missing in your kit. So. Almost, Thank almost, you, okay. Yeah, almost everything we have, we can get individually. We also have for um, like semester to semester replacement as little tiny pieces get bent up and wander off. Uh, just the baggie of electronic components is sold separately as a refresher. I have, I have one thing that I um, need. I got the, um, I already had the, from the Cyberbots, I had the chassis and everything. And so I just bought a bunch of the shields and the shields don't come with those um, little plastic risers for when you screw in the Arduino. Mm -mm. Um, and I'm just wondering if you sell just those risers or if you have, I couldn't find a parts kit that had those. It, you know comes, what I'm about? it comes in the hardware replenishment pack. It should. I can also, uh, if you email me at education at parallax.com and specific, I can give you the part numbers and we can contact um, sales and work out fitting you just those particular items if you need them in bulk. Okay, thanks. I think we can. I'm not 100% sure on that. We might get those pre-kitted as a hardware pack, but um, I can find out. Okay. At the very least, I could give you the exact specifications for them. And honestly, you know, one pair is probably, you know, screw and, and riser is probably enough to hold the board in place. So two is ideal. Yeah, I mean, I have 15 sets of the shield, so I'm mm -hmm. shy 30 of those risers or at least 15 of them. Okay. And you would need the screws as well? And the nylon. Um, I probably have enough screws. I've got a big, I've taken all the hardware stuff and just put it in giant bags full of them. So I have lots of the screws and nuts and things like that. Just not those little risers. I was just mm -hmm. going to maybe 3D print. 
print something plastic or do something with straws or something. That's the you other. You know, idea. it's it's a straw would actually probably work just as well and be right. quick and cheap and no shipping involved. It's just just a little plastic separator. Right. That's a really smart idea. <laughs> um, while I have you, um, I was going to bring up one other thing. Um, so we did have these all last year. I did the, my, the, the micro bit version of this. Mm -hmm. um, and we always had problems with the batteries falling out. Mm -hmm. So I did have a student who just today started building a, a 3D printed sort of battery holder piece that fits into those slots. Oh, across. that's sweet. Yeah. Very nice. It has totally depended on battery brands. We've noticed over the years that there's very slight dimension differences in yeah. length and width that can make or break how well they fit in um, the battery packs and how well they stay in place. We've, we've seen this in other uh, products as well. That is a really good solution. Another yeah, I mean, it just I've, sort of yep. looks like this and it yep. fits in those little slots. Oh, so cool. Like That's really think? nice. Is yeah, that so I can send you the agent? STL file for that if you want. Sure. It's a great um, thing to distribute. Do you also have it like on Thingiverse or anything? We will. I mean, we're still fine tuning it. It's still a okay. little too thin, but um, mm -hmm. it does. It I can almost drop it, and it won't. Nothing will fall out. So it's it's pretty good at holding them in. That's really fun. I have so, also seen little Velcro uh, cinch straps. Yeah, we use yeah. Velcro so like the, the Velcro straps that we yeah, use we on used those last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got those too from last year. Oh, there they are. <laughs> right, that's enough of that. All right. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> hey, everybody, I, I have another, um, I, I made a mistake because I, I was, uh, I had a, a different um, wiring diagram in my mind from, from a different robot. I, I said that the two longer leads would go toward the middle. That's not correct. The two longer leads, the two anode leads are going to essentially be um, closer to you if you have the board shown as it is here. So see, this is the longer anode lead for this light emitting diode. So the longer lead on the lower of the two is going to be at the very bottom row. The longer lead on the upper of the two is going to be four rows from the top. Now, um, for those, for any of you who already have your, um, your circuit built up, it's very important to go through uh, and just check every single connection. So for example, starting with five volts, the first jumper goes to the topmost row and shares the topmost pin of the infrared receiver. The infrared receiver, the little bump on it, which is actually the where it lights lets infrared light in, should be facing forward, the same direction as your um, infrared LED. Your next five volts should jump down to again the um, the top pin of the infrared receiver, and there should be one pin empty that doesn't have an infrared receiver pin it down at the bottom. So the, the top pin of the infrared receiver should share with the red wire that's coming from five volts. Then looking at the ground connections, you're going to come from GND up to the center pin of the lower of the two IR receivers. And then there's going to be another black jumper that goes to the center pin of the upper of the two IR receivers. Now those center pins of each IR receiver should be sharing with the shorter pin of the infrared LED on that same row of five. These are all things to double check as I call them out. Okay, the lowest pin of the upper infrared receiver should be sharing with the red, red, brown 220 ohm resistor and that red, red, brown 220 ohm resistor should be going into P10. The longer IR LED pin should be the lowest of the four rows up top. 
and it should be connected to a 2K red, black, red resistor that goes to pin nine, digital socket nine. Down at the bottom, um, at the on the very bottom row, the longer anode lead of the IR LED should be connected to a red, black, red 2K resistor that goes to socket two. Then the, um, the lower output pin of the IR receiver should be connected to a red, red, brown resistor that goes to socket three. Double check all your connections. And, um, and can I get some thumbs up? How, how are we doing building the circuit? Everybody got it? I'm seeing thumbs up. Can, can somebody give me a thumbs down if they're not there yet and need some time? All right, well, in that case, let's, okay, excellent, everybody. Okay, so what I'm going to do is normally in the textbook, the students actually test them one at a time, but I'm gonna give you the name of a, of a sketch to test both. And the name of that sketch is gonna be from chapter, um, uh, chapter seven. So when we, when we open from our pre-written code, we're going to go to the ShieldBot code folder and then to chapter seven. And then the name of the sketch is test both IR and indicators. Test both IR and indicators. So that's the sketch we want to open from the chapter seven folder. Test both IR and indicators. And I uh, still don't need to plug in the battery power yet. Just set the um, set the switch to position one, and then um, one important thing is when you set the switch to position one, check for this green LED to come on. See the green LED that's going off and then back on. Okay, you want to make sure that green LED is on. If it doesn't come on, um, turn the power off and recheck your circuit for a possible circuit mistake. I might have them too. We'll see. So the next thing to do is run the sketch using the upload arrow. And then, then uh, uh, yes? The other day, um, I had no problems with my opening the files from the zip folder that you sent. Mm -hmm. But today, it's not recognizing it. <laughs> Okay, so make sure that you're not opening from inside the zip. You want to be opening from inside the folder. Right. I unzipped it. I'm opening okay. the unzipped folder. Okay. So let's see here. Which um, which platform are you using? I uh, the other day I was using the web editor. Okay. Are you still using that today, or are you? Did yeah, you switch? I'm or it today. I'm using it today. Okay. As well. All right. So here we are in the. Let me make sure I didn't. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm good. All right. So from here, it's going to be import that little up arrow. Okay. And then and then select import. And then browse to shield bot code. Find chapter seven. Find test both IR and indicators. Then make sure to select 
test both IR and indicators.ino and then hit open. Okay. And it should say it's importing and then successful. Hopefully. It's hard to it's hard to know what everybody else's computer is is doing, but uh, that's that's the that's the way we want it to work. And then when you hit the arrow, now the other thing is nothing is going to happen um, aside from it's playing a tone after you hit the arrow. What you have to do is um, once you hear the tone, then go ahead and open the serial monitor. And I'm going to close it on this because I can resize it a little bit better in the Arduino IDE so that everybody can see it. OK, so here's test both IR and indicators. And so I'll go ahead and run it again. And then remember, um, serial monitor for this one is over on the upper upper right. So once it says done uploading, we can go ahead and click the serial monitor. And then we'll see the ones scrolling down just like we did really with the whiskers. Okay, now. Um, What's the name of the sketch again, Andy? Test both. IR, um, test, both test both IR, IR and indicators. Oh, I see a typo in the comment. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> OK, now, um, this is something where when your students are doing this, you're going to have to impress upon them that testing is just oh so crucial. I have not tested this yet. I was building it with you guys, so I don't know. But what I want to happen is when I put my hand in front of that tube on the, on the robot's right, the, the lower tube in the image here, I want to see the one on the right change to zero. So I'll put my hand in front of it. And lo and behold, now I'm not putting my hand in front of both, just in front of the one. And I want to see the, the column on the right in the, in the serial monitor change to zero. When I take my hand away, I want it to change to one. Okay, now I'll go ahead and put a box in front of, um, oh, that's weird. So I might have a problem here. Yeah, I can put my hand in front of the tube on the left. And it's just staying one. So I have probably a circuit mistake. Okay, nine and ten. Check your pin twelve. Uh, no, sorry, it's pin nine. Pin nine, the resistor on the LED side. You need oh, to up one. Bad. I put it in the wrong row, huh? You guys have really good eyes. We've done it before, yeah. Yeah, so we're saying something like that, right? Yeah, well, that's definitely going to cause it, whether or not it's the only cause. Yeah, it, that was the only cause. Thanks, folks. That's great. Okay, so it's crucial that everybody's circuit can pass this test. So we, we may actually want to, um, anybody whose circuit is not passing this test, we may want to have me unscreen share and, and get some community help just like I got. So how are you all doing? Thumbs up, thumbs up. All right, so for those of you who have given me thumbs up. Um, the next 
sketch I want you all to open is also going to be in chapter seven. Okay, so file, open. And it's going to be called Fast IR Roaming. That's Fast IR Roaming. And for this one, you'll need to plug in your batteries, set power to two and have an obstacle ready or well be ready to put it on the floor and, and put your hands in front of it i will show you uh, just a quick test holding the robot to kind of get an idea if it's changing direction um let's see so is this fast eye or roaming no that's roaming with whiskers so open fast eye or roaming It opens it on another screen, so it takes me a second. Make sure to close your terminal um, if you have the Arduino IDE. Because it's gonna open in a new instance, but it won't be able to program if your terminal is still connected with the, uh, with the won't be able to program in the other window. So let's see. Um, so yeah, we'll run this without, we'll leave this power switch in one and we'll simply load the sketch into the, um, into the shield bot. Okay, so we can hear that the sketch is running. So the next thing we wanna do is, Zoom out a little ways here. Okay, so um, here we are. So next up, leave the three position switch in position one, plug in power and unplug the USB. Then, There we go. All right. So now basically, if this goes forward and sees an obstacle, it's going to turn away from the obstacle. If it, if it sees uh, both, I'm actually not sure which way it'll turn. It might back up on, I can't remember, I'll have to look at the sketch. And then if it, if it sees an obstacle on this side, it'll turn that way. So I'll go ahead and put it in position two. Check my batteries. I'll fell a little bit out. Okay, so it's running. And um, for me, you can see the box that, uh, see how, when I put an obstacle in front of its right IR detector, it turns left. Then, if I put an obstacle in front of its left IR detector, it turns right. That's usually best done on the floor, by the way. So I, I would recommend trying that out and making sure that, that it'll turn away from an obstacle either on the left or the right.
Andy, we have yes. a request to explain some code if you look in the chat. Okay, on my way. Okay, so I are left. All right, so let me bring that up. Okay, so I believe the question is about Just a second, I'm checking to see IR detect. So which which program is that from? That was the fast roaming. Oh, fast IR roaming? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, IR detect. So we have um, we have a call that's coming in. Now that call is for the left side. It's IR detect nine ten thirty eight thousand. So then jumping to IR detect. We have nine, 10, 38,000. Okay, so tone nine makes, um, so this is, this is nine and this is 38,000. That's going to the IR LED connected on pin eight, socket eight. So what this does is, oh, I'm sorry. No, it's for eight milliseconds. It's going to, it's going to socket nine. It's, um, it's turning the IR LED on and off 38,000 times a second. And that's gonna last for eight one thousandths of a second. So then there's a short delay. And that basically is giving the IR receiver time to realize that it sees this reflected tone. So even though it, it's called a tone because we normally use it for speakers, in this case, what I'm doing is sending an ultrasonic tone, 20,000 Hertz would be the, the highest that most humans can hear. So this is 38,000, so that's in the ultrasonic range. And uh, so it's, it's flickering the light very quickly, which is what we want for the receiver which has a filter inside it to see 38 kilohertz infrared light. We wait to make sure the receiver can see it. And then we say, okay, let's declare a variable called IR and we'll use digital read just, just like was used for the whiskers when it was either a one or a zero. And it's gonna check that IR receiver pin, which is pin 10. And if, if, the, um, if the digital read returns as zero, that means it saw reflected infrared. If it returns a one, that means it didn't. Um, the next delay is just to basically leave some downtime before checking um, another infrared LED and then it returns the, uh, the state, either a one or a zero to the call that happened up here. And so that one or zero gets stored there. It repeats it for the other pair. And then uh, with that information, it uses something almost like, the, um, almost like the whiskers code. And in fact, I've skipped over one where it uses something exactly like the whiskers code. And this one is just a higher performance version where there's 20 milliseconds spent in any given maneuver before going and checking the infrared receivers again. Um, can it be an audio tone? Um, no, it's, uh, uh, well, I mean, you could use an audio tone, but um, like we do with the speaker, but um, these, uh, 
the the filter inside the infrared receiver is um, is what is is looking for thirty eight thousand blinks a second. All right, how's that? Kind of a a little advanced explanation. Now I want to emphasize that that explanation is in there. For example, in the book here, it talks about the um, the uh, filter for the infrared receiver and how it's centered on um, 38 kilohertz. And if you instead give it um, 39 kilohertz, it's really only 80% sensitive. By the time you're up to 40 kilohertz, you're down to around 50% of sensitivity. And that's actually a way that we can iteratively make those receivers more nearsighted. So at 38,000 Hertz, it might, th this is um, actually kind of stretched out. It's really only a couple in of inches range, about 10 to 12 inches out. Um, but, uh, but in that couple inch range, um, it'll see as a zone, it, it'll see furthest when you're using 38 kilohertz, less far when you're using 39, and then less far still as you increase the frequencies. And so we can think of those as zones zero through four. And then um, if you'll go ahead and open, uh, file open, and we'll uh, look for display both distances in chapter eight. So we'll go back up to the shield bot code, find chapter eight, and then open display both distances. And there it is. So go ahead and um, reconnect your USB and set your, uh, set your power switch back to one. And let's run this. And again, after, after running it, you'll want to open your terminal. Looks like I have another terminal open somewhere. Mm, that sounds crunchy. Okay, so once you hear the beep, go ahead and, and uh, switch over to the, the terminal. And what we want out of this one, now oh, that's interesting. I wonder why I've got, oh, I think I see why I've got zeros on the right. Okay, now this is gonna give you distance. Again, it's, it's not really the greatest distance measurement. We have a ping ultrasonic sensor that's good down to the centimeter, but um, this one, do you have a request for clarification in the terminal? The first column is the left and the second is the right, correct? That is correct. The first column is, well, the first column is the left, the second column is the right. Okay, so I'm pointing mine up in the air. Oh, you know what? I've probably got some infrared interference here, which is might be why I'm going between fours and fives. But uh, see if I can. Okay, so now I've got all fives. I'm pointing off into space. And as I get my um, hand 
looks like about a foot. So between, okay, so I'm getting fives with my hand right at the edge of the screen. That's about, um, I'd say 15 inches. And then as I come in closer to its right sensor, you can see the numbers starting to decrease. Okay, now I'm at um, about 10 inches, maybe nine inches. So, so for me, that's about nine to 16 inches. It doesn't really have to be precise, but we want those distances to be roughly the same on both sides. And for me, they are. So, um, so that's, that's what you're looking for as far as a distance test. And then, um, and then once, you, once, once you've passed that test, and um, what, we'll, what we may need to do for some of you is, is to stay after or just do a follow-up. Um, but, uh, but if you've got that, if that looks good for you, um, the next uh, sketch to open would be, is it called Following Shieldbot? It's in chapter eight and it's called Following Shieldbot. So open that. Uh, you wanna close your terminal first, then open that and uh, load the sketch with the three position switch in position one. And then once it's done uploading, you can go ahead and Let's go to 1080p on this, get daring. Oh, it is 1080p already. Oh no, it wasn't. Okay, so here we go. Um, I'm gonna disconnect the, the USB cable and then set it to two with my hand in front of it. And now we can see that the force is strong in me. And this is the droid you're looking for, by the way. <laughs> so if you can see, hopefully, hopefully it's nice and visible on the screen, but uh, essentially the, uh, the shield bot is running some following code and it is very faithfully following my hand. And the name of this sketch is Following Shield Bot in Chapter okay. Eight. Okay. This is a really a great one to show your kids. They'll like it. Um, I've noticed a lot of people start anthropomorphizing their robots when it follows them around. Young kids are all, it sees me. And fortunately, the, um, the robots are very tolerant of being anthropomorphized. It doesn't seem to bother them at all. <laughs> it's a really good follower. And then what we do in classrooms is we, you know, try to try to get everybody to do a really good job on testing their, their infrared detection so that they're getting good distances on both sides. And then we see how long of a uh, a string of robots can be following each other. We usually put a piece of paper over the back of the robot to supply a roundish target. I'll show you that in a minute. So that is following shield bot. Set that back to one. All right, folks, we've got 15 minutes left to talk about curriculum, and then you're all welcome to stay after to, um, if you need any help getting your following shield bot uh, running, um, especially for uh, if you're ever talking with somebody who writes checks and um, are interested in it or are interested in generating student interest at, say, um, an event where they're trying to decide what optional classes to take. If you have, say, a CTE class, 
um, the following shield bot is a really good one to have there. Uh, it usually generates some really good interest. So we went to a um, maker's fair and we had a big um, Vex um, hexapod that um, we yeah those we those just, also <laughs> well we just we just flipped switches on it so that it would walk down the hallway and not run into the walls uh -huh, uh -huh. and we weren't really uh, you know following the the coding instructions or anything just flipped switches so that we could get it to where we could drive it down the hall. And if it turned towards a wall enough that it wouldn't stop. And so that was the code we had in it. And we took it to the maker's fair and put it down and it started following people. And we had, yeah, people went nuts. It was great. Everybody's like, who's controlling that? Yeah. <laughs> it, was very, it was very popular. And they get really surprised when they find out that it's all in the sketch that it's running. Right. Just... <laughs> right. Okay. So um, real quick, I, um, there, there really isn't time to go through uh, light sensing, uh, but I do want to mention for light sensing that uh, code-wise, it's the most advanced chapter in the book. So uh, some teachers, especially if their emphasis is computer science, will end up saving it for last. So here we're using the photo transistor. This is just a look at the circuit. Um, that is used in the second half of the chapter. We, we use a, a different phototransistor circuit and measure its voltage, but uh, for this, we're measuring something akin to RC decay. And the, the book goes into it in great detail. But what's kind of fun is, is you can, uh, after uh, some tuning and some calculations, you can get a, a, an, a, an indication of how much shade is on the left versus how much shade is on the right. And then basically you can say, well, if it's shadier on the right, speed up the left wheel. If it's brighter on the right, slow down, or if it's shadier on the left, speed up the right wheel. And with a sketch that does that, it will follow light. And it's kind of fun to, you know, turn the light down in the room and then have some bright light streaming through the door and have an entire swarm of robots uh, flock out the door. And again, that was navigate by light. Not sure why I have that twice, but now I don't. Replacement parts. Now we're on to the, um, basically purchasing and curriculum. So replacement parts are available at parallax.com. Um, I have a specific address for you later, um, but you can also use this slide and simply see the part numbers. So where it says SKU here, each of those parts, you can just go to www.parallax.com and type in that SKU number to get to that part. The small robot electronics pack, if, if you're equipping your classroom with shield box, bots, you definitely want to get several um, of the small robot electronics packs and of the small robot hardware packs. And I apologize in advance. Uh, this slide may be dated. I don't know what the current prices are, but they're, you know, in general, it's a, it's a really reasonable price for these replacement part packages. I think I showed this off on the first day. This is the, um, this is the roaming with a rotating ping uh, ultrasonic sensor on a turret. Um, and uh, so the, uh, some of the popular add-ons for the shield bot are the TV remote, the ultrasonic rotating turret, a color detector, and then uh, the kitty cat project uses a audio shield. Where do you find those? Those are on learn.parallax.com. I'll paste the uh, the link into the um, into the chat. So, do you still sell the expansion packs? Expansion packs? You mean um, you mean those those the kits for doing these projects? Yeah, they come in the black and yellow. Absolutely. So, so for example, here I'll I'll go ahead and uh, copy, and then let's see where's the chat here. Paste. Whoops. Okay, so that's the address of um, 
of the basically the main page that has the uh, that has the entire web textbook, but it also has projects. And so here is, for example, the TV remote project. And when you go in there, it actually has links to the parts that you would use. So for example, here's the robot kit, but, um, but here's also the universal remote. There are also kits that um, that contain uh, parts for all these projects, except for Kitty Cat Bot. I think we need an extra um, shield that is uh, can be purchased elsewhere. Oh, likewise with the robot arm drawing project. So basically, the shield, the roaming with ping, the um, IR remote control, and the Pixie cam color sensor. And I feel like I'm missing something. I guess that might be it. I think crawler legs would also be compatible, but it didn't need an extra project because yeah. it's the same code. But it would be uh, visible in the shield bot section of the store. Site. Yes, which we want to go to next okay. or soon. So this is just a, a quick excerpt from the the TV remote. And then here is the all things shield bot related page, which I'll also copy into the chat. There you go. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This is this is an overview of the shield bot. And then the expansion possibilities are, um, well, that's going to take us to Shieldbot projects. OK, I'm going in circles here. Sorry about that, folks. Um, that was the wrong link. Let me just go to the correct link. So I'm just going to go to www.parallax.com and then hit shop. And then along the left-hand side, it's going to say Shieldbot. Oops, I hit Cyberbot because it expanded. I see that some of you, or I saw earlier today that some of you signed up for the Cyberbot course after taking this one. Congratulations, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, let's see here. So where is Shieldbot? There it is, shield bot. Okay, so I will paste this link in because this is all things shield bot. Okay, so here in the shield bot section, we have um, a class pack. Now that has, um, all the extras. It's got TV remotes. Oh, that's right. The QTI line follower is the one I was forgetting. So this, um, the uh, the shield bot with Arduino, the, the 12 pack for classrooms um, has 12 remotes for the, for the TV remote control. It's got uh, 12 QTI line followers so that you can put a uh, electrical tape line down on a, um, on a, on a white background, like a poster board is nice and um, have it have it follow obstacle courses that way. And then uh, it also has that uh, turret that we were talking about. Um, but everything on this page is supposed to be compatible with the um, with the shield bot. I'm not so sure about the um, the gripper. Uh, whether that should be here or not, but uh, everything else is either a shield bot variation or something like the pixie cam where we're doing color detection. That was uh, the video I played on day one where uh, they were moving a block around in front of the robot, um, one of several colored blocks and the robot always tracked the, um, I think it might've been the yellow block. 
Yeah, so we've got the crawler kit, the uh, ultrasonic sensing bracket. All of these things can also be purchased in individually. So that's all things shield bot. Did I paste that in already? Yes, I did. Okay. Next up is if you have a older Bobot robot, and uh, what, what this is showing actually is this is a slide I grabbed from the Cyberbot presentation. Show, so it's showing that you can upgrade a shield bot or a Bobot to a Cyberbot, but there are also kits to upgrade um, or to cross grade as the case may be. If you're starting with a Cyberbot, you could switch over to a shield bot. Uh, and likewise, if you're starting with a Bobot, you could upgrade to a shield bot. And those kits, one of those kits, for example, would appear back on the shield bot page that we were just at right here. So this is the Bobot to shield bot retrofit kit with Arduino Uno. And there's also one that comes without the Arduino Uno in case you already have one. Okay, educator resources. Let's go to learn.parallax.com. This is what I had you sign up for, uh, or you know, make sure you could sign into learn.parallax.com because you can go to educators and then click Shieldbot resources. I'll paste this one in. It's also on the slideshow. And when you're here, there's, there's some public facing stuff that's useful. Um, Arduino software downloads. Ah, here we go. Standards matrix. So um, that was mentioned in the video. This is where to find it. And so if you need to do standards alignment with one of the uh, four standards that's listed in the standards matrix, or no, I'm sorry, five, then um, you're, you're, you're good. Uh, there's some strategy guides. Um, and then the, uh, the textbooks, scope and sequence. So you can plan your class, it's a spreadsheet. And then there's the educator materials. And for that, you have to log in. Okay. Such a hackable password. Okay, back. All right, so after logging in, if I refresh this page, now I get a different link down here. Instead of saying it's locked and you have to log in, it's saying, oh, you're a teacher who must be ready to go and get some solution sets. And thanks to Andy Bell, we got a heads up that the full robotics zip is um, there's a problem with it, but it is broken down into chapters here. And so, for example, we could save chapter four, teacher materials. And then I have to find my file browser. Okay, so here's chapter four question sets. And then we'll just open the PDF real quick. And so here are some question sets that you can give to students as quizzes and exams. And then in red, we have the solutions. Uh, that is in addition, by the way, to some practice sets that um, that are available in the textbook. So if you go to, um, it's in the on, it's it's in the printed textbook you have, uh, but I'll just show you from the web textbook. Okay, so Arduino Shieldbot main student resources, and when you're done with chapter four, or when the students are done with chapter four, there's a chapter four summary section. 
And so, first of all, it, it summarizes the chapter. But then it has a list of questions, exercises, and projects for the student to try out. And this will give them practice so that uh, either as homework assignments or, or quizzes, um, also, you know, some of these just adjusted slightly work really well as closed book quizzes. Um, they, all of the ones that are in the textbook that are shown are also solved. And so that's why we have a teacher's area where there are some, um, so these are the solutions right here. And that's why we have a, a teacher's area on the learn site where you can go to get um, another set of questions, exercises, and projects. Now there's other curricula available for this. For example, at cyber.org, um, they have some Arduino material and you can, if you're a teacher in the United States, you can hit the sign up button. Um, and then if you sign up from your, your work email, they'll, um, they'll check it and then send you sign up instructions. Now, when you go in there, um, you'll be able to access not just their shield bot um, lessons, but all of the um, computer science, um, physics, they, they, have, they have quite a variety of curricula available at cyber.org. Cyber literacy is one where you will see the uh, robotics option. And then when you follow that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Arduino mm -hmm. robotics, and there you are. Um, another one that uses the Shield bot is Carnegie Mellon. I included links to um, their training page. Uh, they have a course coming up uh, July. The next one up is July 25th through 29th. And that's using the, uh, the very same Shield bot you've already got. They also, um, during that training, they would show you this curriculum that, uh, that students can go to and then basically follow the links and work through. And, um, and as they work through each, um, each activity, for example, drive forward, they're gonna have the student write the sketch and then, um, and then essentially they'll give you some quick questions after you've made it go. So that's their approach. If you're looking for something slightly lighter, it's a good one. And for some reason, I have a big repeat of a lot of stuff. Uh, one last thing, the, um, the shield bot following uses um, something that engineers refer to as proportional control to repeatedly measure the distance and then decide uh, how much to adjust the, uh, the speed and direction the wheels are turning. And we actually have the students go through and say, okay, well, if your measured distance is zero or, you know, uh, and then we show some solved ones. And so they, they fill out this table to get a better understanding of how and why the robot is able to react to different distances and still follow uh, your hand. Um, another thing, this is just a quick excerpt from the light sensing chapter. I do wanna emphasize that that chapter is um, some of the most challenging material in the book um, on the conceptual level. Um, the early part of the chapter though is great fun and you can uh, just build and test a light sensor um, and have it you know stop moving when it gets into into a shoebox for for example uh, or under a bright light uh, but when when you get to the end of the chapter when it's essentially, automatically adjusting to um, any old light situation that it might find itself in and then doing the calculations for which side is brighter and then turning. Um, it's, uh, it's using pretty much as, as much as we can possibly throw at the, uh, the students and the Arduino as far as code uh, chat level of challenge goes. And um, I'm sorry, I guess I got to talking. It is six minutes over. Um, is it, but that is uh, that is the end of it. Well, aside from the fact that we have an educator hotline, um, 
education at parallax.com is one that everybody in the department will see and at least one person will reply. Uh, the educator hotline, you can call um, during normal business hours, specific time and um, get a live person who is Ari that you have been chatting with currently. And then I also included our sales and some other resources here, including Facebook. So thanks for coming everyone. It's been great having you and communicating both uh, during the workshop and offline. And now let's go ahead and open it up to any questions or comments that you might have. Stephanie, I see you waving. I just want to say um, everyone who is here today, I have been taking attendance and I will send you a certificate documenting your eight hours of um, professional education. <laughs> Thank you for the thumbs up, course. Jessica. <laughs> But those will be on the way today. Can I have one too? <laughs> sure. Oh, thank you. I'll put it on my wall. <laughs> and also, if you couldn't attend this class and you are watching the video, mm -hmm. uh, you can also ask Stephanie. And we know that you watch the video because um, that's the only way, I think, to know that they need to ask. Yeah. You. yeah <laughs> so don't, if, you, if you made it this far through the last yeah. video, we'll believe <laughs> you. Yeah. Just, yes. So don't put it in your email blast, Andy. Uh, <laughs> yes. Roger that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, also, you may receive an email from Ken Gracie as a follow up eventually. Sometimes, sometimes he sends it uh, the email about a year later. Sometimes. He does it a couple of weeks after the class. So eventually you may get an email from Ken and he will be asking. It's like a feedback for the class uh, kind of contact. Oh, I, I have a question. Uh, the uh, color diagram for the infrared sensors, is, is there a possibility of uh, getting that so we can see the colors to pick the uh, resistors? I am so glad you asked because I forgot to show you guys that. Okay, so it's in it's it's in the web book. So uh, oh, um, so a couple of examples of that. Um, so if we go to learn.parallax.com, I'll paste in the link after I browse there. Um, Arduino Shield Bot. So um, one way to do it would be through the web book in chapter seven. Maybe you can share the screen. I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we can see that. Thanks. Uh, let's see here. I got to find um, the. Uh, it's also in the reference section as a standalone page. In addition to being. Share a screen. Okay. Okay. So here I am. Uh, did I do that right? Can you guys see the, the, the learn.parallax.com site? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm having trouble dragging the zoom out of the way. There we go. All right, so here we have all of the pictures that you saw in the slides. Now, this is a lower res version. It's, it's good enough to build from on your computer screen, but if you want to project, the other way to do it is the, the book that, we've, that we downloaded. So the, the students will get, if, if they use the web book, they'll get the color version. And then the other way to get the color version is with the book. And I believe that I can just go to the front page and then uh, let's see, oh, actually. Download the free PDF, it was there. Yes. Darn, okay. Um, I'll, I, I, I intended to post that link in, uh, let's see here but going to the cover page, download the free PDF. Yeah. Copy link address. And then um, I think I already downloaded it. So let's see here. First of all, I got to paste this into you guys. Chat, paste, there we go. Um, next up, I really want you to see this. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to downloads where I should have downloaded it. Oh, great, sorry. 
I'm just going to download it again. Thirteen seconds, one second, ready. Okay, now it's it's actually better if you open it with um, Adobe Acrobat Reader or Adobe Adobe Acrobat Full, but um, I'm I'm just opening it in the web browser right now because I don't want to take too much time going over this, and I'm trying to navigate currently to the uh, page that has the drawing because. The, the main thing I want to really emphasize here is that when you've got this PDF textbook, it maintains the um, it maintains the integrity of any of the vector drawings, regardless of how far you zoom in. Now, if we zoomed in by four hundred percent in the web version it would look rather pixelated. But here, it is nice and clear. And so what I like to do when I'm, when I'm um, populating a slideshow, well, I would start with the slideshow for the course because it's going to have a lot of the slides already. But as you're going through the textbook, you're going to see other things that you may want to take and make color printouts of or or you know zoom in like for example you know you may have started with the slideshow but you might actually just want to take a screen capture of say just this little part right here in super high detail and so um, if you're using the pdf the vector diagrams and th this is a um, corel draw vector draw, di uh, drawn in corel draw so it's all vector as opposed to raster and um, and it, it just looks beautiful even at 500%. And so, uh, so that's the way to, um, to get the nice color images. And um, you can take screenshots at whatever zoom level you so decide, and then paste those into your slideshow that you're preparing for your students. Thanks for asking. I, I'm, I totally forgot about that one. So thank you very much. Yeah, Andy, let me make a comment here. Um, uh, uh, blow it up a couple of times like you had it just a second ago. Okay. Like oftentimes, so? Oftentimes when we're teaching and we have a lot of students with a lot of different ability levels, we have to take a blow up like this and we really have to focus on it because there, there is a, a thing in education called figure ground perception. Okay. And, and if we don't have the right, uh, the right configuration, we could cause figure ground perception to go really haywire because you're, what you're doing is you're looking at this diagram, trying to distinguish what's in row one, what's in row two, what's in row three, and mm -hmm. what is very close, what's blocking something or interfering with something because it's so close. So in the earlier part of the lesson today, we were in situations where we had a lot of figure ground perception going on and we really needed to be at this level right here. I see, okay. So that, that's my comment on that, uh, especially if we've got, we're teaching a lot of kids, a lot of different ability levels, because any mistake here is gonna cause delays, it's gonna cause problems in the robot operating and that sort of thing. Although so I'd like to insert about that, that troubleshooting is a very natural part of all of these lessons that, that, um, that we emphasize every lesson or every, every particular circuit topic in the book starts out with building the circuit, um, then testing the circuit, then understanding the circuit, then integrating the circuit into the larger system. And so that is you know, a habit that we hope everybody who goes through the um, book gets, picks up. We, we hope it's a habit that they'll pick up. Um, but also uh, we add, usually wherever possible, some troubleshooting tips saying, hey, you know, if, if, if you don't see that 
one turning to a zero when you push the whisker up against the post or when you put your hand in front of the IR detector, go back and check your circuit because there may be a mistake there. And, um, and also when hand entering the code, there may be a mistake there. And so, so those, are, those are things that we talk about peppered throughout the book to help them get used to troubleshooting their circuit and their code because it's pretty much inevitable. Um, and it's, mm-hmm. it's actually a habit that uh, those who go on to do this kind of thing professionally will be very glad to have picked up at the, an earlier juncture like that. Well, that is very useful information. And I'm going to sign off now, but I want to really thank you for putting in the time, especially all the extra time you put in before, during, and after the class. It was incredible, and it was tremendously helpful. Well, thank you for uh, that recognition, Bob. I'm signing off. I will be in your next class. (laughs) All right. See you then. Yeah. Thank you very much. Our pleasure. Thank you. Okay, next up, any other questions, comments, observations, nits? Oh, I have one. uh, I have a nit, actually. Um, Where is it? Okay, so Andy Bell, if you're still here, uh, thank you for mentioning that this. um, Oh, yeah, I got to go back to uh, screen share. Okay, one of, one of the things that um, looks like there's an error in the book, um, if we compare this to one of the equivalent images in the book, okay, let's see if I can find one. It should be in chapter two. Yeah, we're close. Okay, almost there. Um, So what Andy Bell pointed out to me is that I hastily used um, diagrams that were drawn for robotics with the Bobot, which has a basic stamp microcontroller. And the programs in there actually established 20 milliseconds. No, that is between, that's, that's correct. Oh, it's okay. So this is 20 milliseconds and 1.5 mil. That is correct. Let's see, where is the one that has the error? Page 67. Page 67, thank you. 57 or 67? 60. 67. Perfect, thank you. All right, so yeah, in robotics with the Bobot, this would be correct because um, the basic stamp would spend time sending a 1.7 millisecond pulse followed by a 20 millisecond pause, then another 1.7 millisecond pulse. In the Arduino, it's doing it more correctly by um, spending, starting at a certain time, sending that 1.7 millisecond pulse, and then waiting between the start of the first 1.7 millisecond pulse, waiting for exactly 20 minutes before starting the second 1.7 millisecond pulse. So I have these, we'll go ahead and update the web version of the book with this, because it's it more, accurately reflects uh, what the Arduino is doing. Okay. Anything else? Um, Along that line, you said that the um, basic stamp version, um, it would be correct as way shown in the book on page 67. Um, so that I mean, not exactly right correct, but but close, yes. It doesn't quite make sense to me from a PWM standpoint. Why why would it 
why would it be correct for one controller versus the other? Well, okay. So most, most standard hobby servos still work even when, when the, uh, the time between the control pulses. Ah, okay. You're thinking of PWM. So PWM is a way to use a signal that's similar to this to control motor speed. And oh. th there's a direct connection. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I not sharing? Share screen. Share. All right. So PWM is similar to this. The, these, this, is, this is delivering a series of pulses. And the only thing that matters to uh, a standard hobby servo, at least the older vintages ones, is that you repeat the, um, the, the, the high signal roughly every 20 milliseconds. If you're plus 10 milliseconds or minus two or three milliseconds, that doesn't matter. The only thing that matters to a hobby servo is this high time right here. So now with pulse width modulation or PWM that you're referring to, there is a cycle time, which would be 20 milliseconds, and then a duty cycle, which would be a, a certain amount of that time spent high. And that is normally something that you'd use to control a motor or con to control LED brightness. Um, but with, with a hobby servo, yeah, it still works as it comes from the Arduino, but it also works as it comes from the basic stamp because of the fact that the, that the hobby servo is really only concerned with the amount of time the pulses stay high. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, I understood what you said. Okay. I'm not sure I totally appreciate what you said in terms of like, because I'm I look at it as like, all right, if I'm gonna do, use this in an engineering class and I want to teach pulse width modulation, I I kind of gravitated to this and says, oh great, we could teach pulse width modulation. And that's not really true then. That's uh, correct. It's it's not pulse servo. width. Yeah, so that's, it's that's that's where the, the confusion lies. Yeah. Um you'll want to use not, D you'll want to use DC motors or LED lights. To, to show the effects of pulse width modulation. Um, for servos. You have, a, you have DC motors too that you can use PWM to be able to uh, replace the continuous servos? That, that um, that's not something that, that we make available now. Okay. All right, thank you. Certainly. Okay, anything else? Well, oh, actually. Um, here, I do have something to show you, Andrew, about um, pulse width modulation. Let me see. So it's learn.parallax.com. I was, I wanna... I was also curious, when you're going there, I was also curious about, I don't think we've covered any, like when you look at the Arduino, there ought to be um, a prelude to this where you talk about how the Arduino works, uh, go over the the topology of the Arduino a little bit, maybe, or the, the basic code that you're using. All right, let's talk right about that. That it. was actually yeah. in the home, that was in the homework. Um, so for example, if you go to ShieldBot, the, the homework was to do excerpts from chapter one. Chapter one is titled Your ShieldBot's Brain. And so here we have, um, a whole bunch of step-by-step. -step, I mean, in, in this class, we have to go quickly, almost skipping like a stone over a fairly deep pool. But, um, but each of these chapters, let me get to the, let me. Okay, my bad. I, I, didn't, see, I didn't catch that. Oh, no worries, no worries. Yeah, the, the, um, yeah not everybody had the, the time, I don't think, to, to do the homework, but those who did, what my hope was, was they'd, they'd see very clearly that, that, we're, we're, that we're really are starting from square one, doing, right. for example, a hello sketch. And then even before that, talking about the hardware and software and, and programming options. Okay, great. So that, that is all in there. It's definitely all in there. No, I'm so glad you asked. Perfect. 
And so here, uh, here's the hello sketch, and then here's storing values, solving math problems, all the really basic stuff that would that you'd want to that you'd want to cover before starting to do the circuit applications. And then in chapter two, we do very basic cir circuit applications, like first um, connecting some LED lights, or well, first setting up the board. But once once we set up the shield here, um, we start by building an LED light indicator, and then we go step by step through that. And that that's where you notice the um, that may have been where you first note. Or, or so here's the example from the slideshow of talking about the um, talking about the rows of five circuits. So we also we also go very slowly and deliberately and in detail through building very basic circuits as well as building very basic code examples. And, um, and so th those are things that I, I kind of glossed over during the presentation, and, uh, but, but it's all in there. It's, um, there. There's a very detailed, methodical, meticulous, step-by-step, -step, trying not to lose any student along the way as we go from the beginning to the end of the book. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Excellent. All right, is there anything else? Shall we uh, stop recording? Or should we keep going? I don't know. I want to get all the good questions and teacher comments. Oh, um, while I've got a few of you left, has anybody been using the Arduino web editor in their class? OK. we've. We've looked at it and we think that it even works for classes of 12 and under where COPA compliance comes into to, um, to play. And uh, what we're trying to do is, is reach out to teachers and find out if anybody has been using it at that age range and if they feel like it's okay or if they feel like they really need CodeBender with Chromebooks. Uh, I might send that out as a question um, for the after the, the class thing. Okay, last chance, everyone. Well, thanks all for coming and we're gonna stop the recording now. Thank you. Thank you for your help, that was great. It's a pleasure. Thanks for Thank coming you. and we'll see it possibly.